Deep in the Amazon rainforest lives a people who could transform our understanding of human language. They call themselves the Hiai Chehe, which means the straight one. And our language is a pagaiso, a crooked head, a twisted head. Daniel Everett's mission was to bring Jesus to this remote tribe, known as the Pidaha. My main aim was to translate the Bible for a group of people who didn't have the Bible. Instead, the missionary found a group so content in their world, they converted him. I've gone from a very fervent believer to an atheist. Even more remarkable is what he discovered about their communication. According to Everett, Peter Haar grammar breaks one of the fundamental rules of all human language. Half a world away, it sparked a bitter war of words. I had people sending me hate mail. There was a lot of viciousness in the attacks, real anger. Can't have anything to do with the nature of language. It's just, doesn't yeah. make any sense. I think he knows he's wrong. That's what I really think. I was appalled when I read that Chomsky had said that Dan was a charlatan. Now, that is unacceptable. Now a professor of linguistics, Daniel Everett is on a new mission to put his controversial claims to the test. If he's right, the most cited academic of our time could well be wrong. And our understanding of human language may be changed forever. In a remote corner of the Brazilian Amazon live the 400 remaining members of the Pidaha. Life has changed little here in centuries, but something about the Pidaha has caught the world's attention. It's how they communicate. Peter Ha can be spoken, hummed, sung, even whistled. I buy about 150 to 200 kilos of manioc meal, farinha, as it's known locally, for the pinaha each time I go in. 400 kilometers upriver, Professor Daniel Everett is preparing for his annual research trip to the Pidaha. Everett has studied the tribe for 30 years, and what he claims to have found has made news around the globe. There are just a narrow range of gifts that they want to receive. They want cloth, they want tools, they want uh, uh, maybe flashlights and batteries, uh, fish hooks and line. Uh, little things. They, they never ask for big things. They always ask for little things, and and they always say, "I uh, which means I almost begin to want that." The linguistics professor and university dean believes the Pidaha language is so remarkable it undermines the most powerful theory of human language. It's an explosive claim, 
and many are convinced he's wrong. The gifts that I buy for the Pitaha are important to show them, first of all, that I appreciate and respect what they do uh, in helping me. Uh, they don't really understand what the value of the information they give me is, but they do know that it is of value to me. That's 100 kilos on his back. He's only got 50 kilos. It's very important for me as a scientist to give other scientists more information so they can reach their own conclusions about some of the more controversial claims I've made about the Pitaha. And we're off after all the work that has gone on the last couple of days, really excited. The Pidaha live in four villages spread along the Maisi River, a tributary of the Amazon. First sighted by Portuguese gold hunters 300 years ago, the tribe has since rejected almost all outside influence. Unique amongst Amazonian groups, the Pidaha speak only their native tongue. But in the 1950s, the Pidaha were forced to open their world with their children dying of measles. Help arrived in the form of American missionaries. But with medicine came something less welcome. One of the missionaries who came was Daniel Everett. This has to be one of the most beautiful river trips on the planet. We're gonna travel down the Madeira River, the seventh largest river of the world, to uh, the Maisi River in the state of Amazonas to see the Pitaha. Everett first made this journey with his young family in 1977. I was raised in Southern California and I came from a very uh, blue collar family. My stepfather worked in a packing shed. My father was a cowboy. My mother was a waitress. I was uh, playing my guitar all the time, flunking all my courses in high school, smoking marijuana every day, convinced I wanted to be a rock star. And then in high school, I met uh, a fellow who was, had a Brazilian magazine, and I asked him where he got this Brazilian magazine, and uh, he said, um, well, my, my uh, parents are missionaries in Brazil. And he had this very cute sister uh, named Karen, and we got to talking a lot about uh, what to do with our lives and we got romantically involved with one another from the time we were 16 and got engaged at 17 decided we wanted to be missionaries and uh, when i come back here now i think a lot of the time that i arrived here originally with my family and the work and the dreams and the aspirations and the love for these people the love i felt for god at that time i was passionate a passionate believer uh, I was ready to die for my faith and ready to do anything that my faith required of me. I had no idea when I started. Trying to convert another group of people is 
an inherently colonialist activity. It's the colonialism of the mind, of beliefs. It's just another form of colonialism. When Everett first arrived here, he was just 25 years old. When we landed, the previous missionary flew out with us, and he just stayed for an hour or so and then left, and he taught me two phrases which I couldn't repeat. They were just too hard for me then. He said, tell them that you just want to hear Peter Ha, and that phrase is, and I didn't remember, I couldn't remember any of that. So I was just here sort of dumbfounded, not knowing what to do. There's a pinaha. There's our first pinaha. I'm gonna go downstairs. So I'll cap it. Yeah, I check up your I'll go. I yo, I my eyes are high, pow, I see, aba, I go. Yeah, I check, I go, aga. I get here. No. Now, aga. Okay. Just a while, I will fight, go by so, go by, I check, eh? I tell, we see, I check, eh? So, what, go by so, go by, I check, eh? Oh, fight, come here, go away. They just recognize me. Oh, it's always great to see how excited the Pitaha get when I come here. I uh, feel like a rock star after all sometimes when I come in here. <laughs> but the feeling is mutual. I feel just as excited to see them as they seem to be to see me. The four-day boat ride means even today the Peter Ha receive few visitors. This is the first time they have seen a film crew. The Peter Ha's clothing is their one concession to modern life. There are no permanent buildings, no cultivation, and they rely almost entirely on nature to meet their needs. Today, the professor is one of only three outsiders who can speak Peter Ha the others being his former wife and the missionary he replaced. <laughs> I said that uh, for the price of coffee, we just want to keep one child. <laughs> they, they, was, they said, well, there are a lot more upriver, take one of those. <laughs> Everett and his family lived intermittently here for more than 30 years. Uh, this is all that's left of my house, just a few support posts here and there. Uh, I raised my children here for several years. I lived here for eight years. I had a large uh, Pitaha style house. <laughs> My wife almost died here. My daughter almost died here. I had malaria many times here. Our lives were threatened by the Pitahas here on at least three separate occasions. They threatened to kill us all, and I had to sit up all night out in front of the house while my family was locked inside to try to keep them away. They shot arrows at each other. They were really uh, different then, and our relationship has changed over the years. <laughs> Today, Dan shares a more harmonious relationship with the Pidaha. This morning, they cook scrambled alligator eggs for him. <laughs> but sharing this way of life would have been impossible if Everett had not first cracked their language code. So if you just arrived here among the Pitaha and you didn't speak a word of the language, how would you go about learning the language uh, in the midst of all of this? 
Well, you start with, uh, since there's no language in common, I just start picking up objects and trying to get the names for those objects, pointing at them. Boy, be up, I be up, I I boy. And and spending day after day doing this, you can see how you can construct the knowledge of the language without any language in common, and eventually I learned Pitaha. <laughs> Everett's teacher was Kohoi. The word for ear is awe. And the word for skin is awe, and the word for foreigner is awe, and the word for hand is awe, and the word for Brazil nut shell is awe, and that's only distinguished by the tones, all of those. <laughs> As his fluency grew, Everett began to realize something was missing. The Pidaha have no words for colors, no past or future tense, and incredibly. The Peter Ha have no numbers. Research from MIT indicates the Pidaha may be the only culture on Earth without numeracy. The Pidaha don't have numbers because they don't need them. They survive just fine without them. Somebody asked me once, you mean Pidaha mothers don't know how many children they have? Well, that's exactly what I mean. They don't know how many children they have, but they know all of their children's names and they know all of their children's faces. Uh, they don't need to know how many children they have to know who their children are and how they feel about them. Years of hunting with these people led Everett to another discovery. The Pidaha have an encyclopedic knowledge of their world. Every Pidaha child, woman, and man in the entire culture knows the name of every single species of flora and fauna in their environment. Yeah, 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 water. The thousands of different species that they encounter, they not only can give you the name of, they can describe in detail, they can tell you what they eat, they can tell you how they live, they can tell you where they're found. <laughs> As Everett immersed himself in their world, he had a profound realization. Pidaha appear to live entirely in the present. They're not worried about whether they're going to eat later because they know very well they can just go out in the river and get fish. They let each uh, activity be dictated by their needs of the moment rather than by their worries of the future or their knowledge of the past. They live in the present. The pursuit of happiness means living free of regret and future worry. It's something the Peter Ha seem to have mastered.
when I'm around these people and I'm by myself with them and I talk to them, they're just uh, so relaxed and so laid back and so hard to agitate and get excited or get worried. They, they just have so much to teach us about taking each day one day at a time. The contentment Everett witnessed affected him profoundly. He began to question his own deep beliefs. The dilemma for the Christian missionary is for your message to uh, work, you have to convince them that they're wrong. So they have to be lost before you can convince them that they need to be saved. I I I I eventually realized that the Pinaha are happy already. They don't believe in hell. They don't believe in heaven. So taking the message of God to the Pinaha is like taking ice to the Eskimos. In 25 years of missionary work, Daniel Everett failed to attract a single Pidaha convert. The questioning of my own faith began as I saw how happy the Pidaha were, as I tried to answer their very probing and direct questions about the nature of the evidence that I had for what I believed. And as I reflected on all of these things, it eventually led to the abandonment of my own faith. This dramatic change triggered the breakup of Everett's family. It was a traumatic experience to have a relationship of over 30 years come to an end like that. I mean, we got married when we were 18, but much more difficult to me was uh, the fact that my children didn't speak to me for two years. And even today, they struggle with some things uh, based on how radically I've diverged from the father that they thought I was in terms of my beliefs. Abandoning missionary life, Everett began to focus on his academic career. He had long suspected something was fundamentally different about Pidaha grammar. And if his hunch was right, it could transform our understanding of human language. At the time that I was going through the uh, spiritual crisis and the family crisis and the marriage crisis, I was also going through an intellectual crisis. And I had to say something about this at the same time that I tried to explain a number of the unique characteristics of the Pitaha language. I had no idea when I started writing this paper that it was going to be controversial to the degree that it was. Daniel Everett had just picked a fight with the father of modern linguistics, Noam Chomsky. Noam is not only the most influential linguist in this sense of the past century, but I think it's probably the case that he's the most influential linguist of all time. I finished the paper, I sent it off to the number one journal of anthropology, and then all hell broke loose. I think he knows he's wrong. That's what I really think. Oh, it, it might be an interesting question of, say, um, social anthropology, but uh, can't have anything to do with the nature of language. It just doesn't make any sense. I had people sending me hate mail, accusing me of uh, racist views. And I think it's a move that many, many intellectuals make uh, to get a little bit of attention. I was appalled when I read that Chomsky had said that Dan was a charlatan, I, I know both these people, and that is not 
a right. Uh, that is unacceptable. The reason there was so much fuss is really not very scientific. I mean, it was, here's this guy coming out of the jungle with this language that only he knows, and he's saying that the greatest linguist in history is dead wrong about his most important idea. I mean, there's also questions about whether any of it's true, but that's another story. The bitter war of words is in reaction to the grammatical anomaly Dan Everett claims to have found. According to Everett, P. de Ha shows no evidence for recursion, the ability to combine an endless number of ideas in a single sentence. So let's say that we have a simple sentence like, Bill saw Mary. And now we want to make that part of a larger sentence. John said that Bill saw Mary. But for this to be recursion, we have to be able to keep going. So we might want to say something like, John said, that Bill said, that Mary said, that Peter said, that Irving bought a house. And that is real, that is true recursion, the ability for a sentence to just keep going on forever. If in a language you can show there is a largest sentence and you can't make it any larger, that language doesn't have recursion. And Peter Ha is such a language. In 2002, Noam Chomsky proposed that recursion is the basis of all human language, a key component of his theory of universal grammar, the most influential idea in linguistics. Universal grammar argues the structure of language, the grammar, is innately found in the human genome, something we are born with rather than learn. According to the theory, all human languages, regardless of their surface differences, share a common deep structure, a universal grammar. It's a powerful idea, and it's dominated linguistics for more than 50 years. In the modern sense, universal grammar is just the theory of the genetic component of the language faculty. Uh, that it exists is hard to deny. If Everett is right about Peter Ha, then many believe the case for universal grammar is severely undermined. Chomsky, who kind of has an outsized influence in linguistics, whatever his latest pronouncement is, everyone takes very seriously. In a recent paper, Chomsky argued that the narrow language faculty, the part of language that's specific to language, consists only of an ability to do recursion. Uh, not every linguist, to put it mildly, accepts that. I don't. Uh, but it was out there as the latest statement from Mount Olympus on what's special about language. And so the claim that there's a language that was missing exactly that thing that Chomsky said is essential obviously made it much more interesting to people. If I'm right and Peter Ha does lack recursion, then recursion can't be the universal basis for human language. So one of us is right and one of us is wrong. It's now been two years since Everett's last visit to the Amazon. At MIT's Brain and Cognitive Sciences Lab, a new expedition is preparing to go and test his claims. Leading the team is Professor Ted Gibson. I think Dan's most controversial claim is the claim that human language doesn't have to be recursive. It's, it might be right and it might be wrong, and I just don't know the answer. I think that's a very interesting, open controversy. How many rules? Along with colleague Dr. Steve yeah, yeah. Piantadossi, Gibson has developed a new computer program for analyzing human language. He's designed it specifically to test Everett's recursion claim. But first, he needs Peter Ha recordings. What Ted and I are doing is, is trying to make, make the debate scientific. And so I think that that's really the only way to, to resolve these kinds of questions. Um, you can't just go back and forth bickering <laughs> you know, all the time. You have to have some kind of scientific method and, and so, some, some kind of uh, quantifiable evidence if, if you want to answer these things. One of the in most interesting properties of this language and culture is that they're uninterested in, in the outside world. So we get a, uh, a look at human cognition without the influence of other cultures, just sort of one culture. This expedition will be the largest and perhaps most rigorous to test Daniel Everett's ideas. In the eyes of many, its results may well settle this debate. 
Everett will accompany the team as translator. But taking on the world's leading linguist is more than an academic argument. It strikes at the heart of where human language stems from. What makes us human? That's what this debate is all about. Where does our language come from? Is our language some mysterious gene that somehow crept into our evolution? If so, that's worth knowing. That's very interesting. What I'm claiming is that culture can affect not just the words of a language, but the entire grammar of a language. And I'm saying that the Pitaha are one clear example of this happening. Perhaps the most radical claim of uh, Dan Everett is that the is that unusual features of Piraha grammar are uh, a consequence of features of their culture. Because there's one uh, generalization that I think almost all linguists would agree with, which is that the variation among languages doesn't have a whole lot to do with variations across the, the cultures of the people who speak the languages. So just to be concrete, I mean, some languages put the verb in the middle and have the object after. Uh, John ate the sushi. Some have the verb at the end. John the sushi ate. But do any of these features correlate with some kinds of culture, with more you know, uptight cultures or expressive cultures or intimate cultures or technological cultures? The answer is generally they don't. For Everett, the detail of how Pidaha culture affects grammar lies in their fixation with the present. This preoccupation, he claims, produces a grammar with only a present tense, a grammar without recursion, a grammar of happiness. <laughs> I <laughs> I <laughs> On the eve of his departure, Everett gets a call from Brazil's National Indian Foundation, known as FUNAI. Oi, Pedro, tudo bem? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's going to be, well, I don't think, I know it's going to be extremely disappointing to uh, Ted and his team. Uh, you know, I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. Well, I mean, I was just told that, uh, you know, after all this planning and all this effort and having gone down that... Um, Valmir, the uh, local uh, Funai uh, supervisor, has said that uh, we can't go back to the village. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think that the only thing I can do is fly all the way down there to Brazil, go talk to Valmir, and say, uh, you know, what can we do to make this happen? With one stamp, Valmir Parinchinchin can grant Everett access to the Pidaha. He is the regional coordinator of FUNAI, the agency responsible for Brazil's indigenous tribes. Eu fui um dos quando assumi, né? É, eu proibi, né, a entrada de todos os tipos de missionários em suas terras, na terra indígena Pirahã. O Daniel tem um Os Pirahã gostam dele, a gente percebe que os Pirahã gostam, mas hoje nós temos a preocupação 
é, da ameaça é, diretamente da cultura piranha é, é a questão dos missionários, né? The fact Everett is now a professor of linguistics doesn't appear to count for much. His old occupation continues to haunt him. So now I'm on my way to uh, Umaita, Amazonas, to meet with uh, Valmir Parinchinchin. Valmir is the one with the power to say whether I can or can't go back to the village right now. If Valmir says no, there's a good chance that that will be no for good. It may be the last chance I ever have to go to the piano. Everett suspects his religious past is not the sole reason for his rejection. The real cause, he believes, is his collision with the linguistics establishment. As a result of my work, I've become uh, quite controversial among linguists. A couple of um, years ago, uh, a couple of U.S. linguists wrote a letter to the National Indian Foundation accusing me of conducting racist research. Whenever it arrives, he's told Valmir is out of town and won't be back for a fortnight. So he's uh, not there. I came all this way and he's not even there. With the rejection in the Amazon, the only course left is an appeal to the president of Funai in the Brazilian capital. It's really important for me to get back to the Pinaha. I have spent so much of my life with those people and I love them so much. So if I'm not allowed to get back there and explain to them, it's, it's like uh, you promise to meet somebody on a street corner and uh, then you never show up. I have no way of accounting for my absence. While his appeal is assessed, Everett visits friends at the University of Brasilia. Professor Arion Rodriguez and Professor Ana Sueli head the Department of Indigenous Languages. They've invited Everett to give a talk, but it's far from a full house. Uh, you know, I've just been informed that the main linguistics department here at the university has decided once again to boycott my talk because it's critical of uh, their theory. It's frustrating because it's not a real scientific attitude of exchange. This isn't what universities are supposed to be about. As línguas humanas têm aspectos formais. A minha questão é a origem desses aspectos formais, né? da, da biologia, dado pela genética, como propôs Chomsky na gramática universal, ou se são apenas respostas naturais ao problema da comunicação em conjunção com valores culturais de cada povo. Bom, eu acho que o seu velho Daniel, no ponto em que está, é extremamente importante para nós linguistas, não só linguistas brasileiros, linguistas no mundo. Né? E eu sei que profissionais linguistas que criticaram o Dene Everett foram a FUNAI para tentar impedir a entrada dele em área. Essa, eu acho que na ciência tem que ter discussões, você tem que considerar os achados linguísticos, não é? Ah, sim. Eu, o, que é, o que é problemático, ao meu ver, não é? É a imposição, não é? A tentativa, é, é aquela, ela quer aquela crença, não é? Quando a ciência ela se torna uma religião, não é? Que não pode ser questionada. Alô, Pedro, aqui fala Daniel. The following day, news arrives at the team's appeal. Sim, tá, tá ótimo. Abraço, tá. Tchau. Uh, não. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't go back. Um, these people have refused to meet with me. They refused to talk to me. They refused to let me go there and present my views. All of this takes place behind closed doors at meetings I'm not allowed to be at, with people saying things about me that I'm not allowed to respond to. It is uh, cowardly. 
I mean, I can't go back this time. I probably never go back as long as, as these same people are in charge. Although Dan and the scientists have been blocked, Funai has allowed our film crew to re-enter the reservation. Not knowing if he'll ever see the Peter Ha again, Dan records a message for the crew to show them. I te guy say, te so o girl ka pe he ai te he e ke o te was we say pe ai ka pe ai te wa ba ge so abe he ai te he pe ba ge so he ai te he e ke o abe he ai te pe ai o we si ba i ko vai so ka ba ka he ai te he ko ho ai pe so ka ba ka ka ge pa he ai te he e ke o a we he guy say te ge e be be he be kwe. O Barack Obama, assaltante de nações, já consumiram todas as riquezas naturais deles lá, tão pobre. O castelo quebrou, agora eles estão assaltando as riquezas. With the expedition cancelled, Ted Gibson and Steve Piantadossi have found another way to test Everett's claims. They've turned to recordings made over decades by Everett and the missionary who preceded him, Steve Sheldon. So these are all stories? Yeah, these are all stories. And how much of that is Dan's gathering versus Steve Sheldon's? Um, it's almost all Steve Sheldon's. But yeah, so it was a big letdown when, when we didn't actually get to go. But actually, we wouldn't have as much time to, to work on this specific question if we had gone, because we would have all of these other um, research areas that, that we'd be, you know, trying to write up findings for. We, we have compiled about um, 800 sentences, and pretty soon we'll have, I think, around 1,500. Oh, here's a snake. Yeah, here's what's his name is almost bitten by a snake, and he tells the story of uh, we arrowed the snake. The first step is to build a large Pedaha database. Once the database is complete, over a million possible Pedaha grammars will be written, some with recursion and some without. A computer will then test each grammar against the recordings in the database. Its job? Find the grammar that best fits the Pedaha language. If this grammar lacks recursion, Daniel Everett may have the evidence he needs. While the MIT computers grind through 30 years of recordings, our film crew is returning to the Peter Ha. Besides delivering Everett's message, we have also been asked to collect more recordings. But when we arrive, what we find is totally unexpected. <laughs> Since visiting two years ago, the Peter Ha village of Pikia has been transformed. The Brazilian government has built a health clinic, toilets, and permanent houses here. This remote corner of the Amazon even has electricity. But perhaps most significant is the presence of a school. Peter Ha children are learning Portuguese and how to count. Parte positiva e a parte negativa, né? Eu acho que a parte positiva é que tem uma uma energia, né? E até porque é usado os materiais de microscopista, né, de examinar malária. Me fez a parte negativa. Para esse momento que tem uma tecnologia na comunidade já começa a mudar, né, a cultura totalmente. As crianças hoje já mudou totalmente. De... E o composto principalmente de metano. 
For many outsiders, such change poses a dilemma. On one hand, it empowers the Pidaha. On the other, their unique culture may be lost. Well, when we lose a language, we lose uh, a part of a culture. We lose a, a, a unique product of human creativity aggregated over time by a society. We lose a source of data on how the mind works. I think that the scientific community should make it a priority to document things that are highly informative and that are in danger of disappearing, such as endangered languages. The Pitaha have remained resilient and vibrant for all of their history. They have rejected every attempt by missionaries to convert them, every attempt by the government to subjugate them. This is the biggest challenge the Pitaha have faced in their entire history, and it's difficult for me to predict what's going to happen. My bet is they're going to stay strong, but I could be wrong. <laughs> After filming, we play Dan's message to the Peter Ha. This may be the last time the tribe will ever see him. After three months, the MIT computers have finished analyzing the Peter Ha database. Okay, so we finished analyzing our corpus of around a thousand sentences, and the answer is, as Dan was hypothesizing, I'd say we we don't have evidence for recursion in this. You know, the, the simplest thing I can say is, in our uh, analyses of this corpus, there's no there's no clear evidence of recursive structures. So, you know, in particular, we don't see evidence of several hallmarks of recursive structures cross linguistically, such as uh, conjunction. So that's something that would translate as and in the language. So where we could have John and Bill and Mary and, and Fred were doing something. Similarly, or, the word or, there's no, no John or Mary. There seems to be something different about this language such that it's not, doesn't have a complex syntactic structure. For Everett's critics, such findings don't settle the debate. There are several problems with that. Uh, one is that that method of testing grammars has absolutely no successes to support it, so we can dismiss it. Uh, secondly, there is no question that the language is, is based on a recursive procedure. Will, will you Will you convert Chomskyans? Probably not, is my guess. They won't be converted, you know? It doesn't feel like <laughs> they're convertible <laughs> to me. <laughs> so why is this interesting? Well, what's interesting about cross-linguistic variation, it shows us the ways that we can be different. Humans can be so similar and yet so different in the way that we communicate. When Dan Everett first entered the Amazon 35 years ago, 
Little did he realize that it would end in such controversy. Although science is beginning to validate his ideas, Dan remains unlikely to see the Peter Ha again. In response to his message, his old friends have recorded one of their own. <laughs> My hope for the Peter Ha for the future is that the future is the way they want it to be. It's not my place to say whether they should adapt more or adapt less. We all change. And the Peter Ha, I want them to be healthy and happy, uh, what I would want for any group of people. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs>